So there are two ways that I thought we could structure this. If, if, you know, if everybody's happy with the defining data types for each taxonomy level kind of overarching theme, then we could either start at, um, like we could either start at the top level, um, which is essentially sort of, you know, human anatomy and then work our way down to the single cell, or we could go the other way, starting with a single cell and then going upwards. So the single cell is kind of where most of my expertise is. Um, so I don't know, which way do you think makes most sense, Jonah? I was thinking uh, from the cell, or I was even intrigued by some of the examples of subcellular protein, knowing okay, your so background in this space and kind of working up. If yep. Yeah, that sounds we'll good. Start from the bottom and then work our way up. Okay, cool. Um, so basically, data types for single cells. Um, let's let's kick off. Um, so the obvious one that um, I'd like Matthew to put into the the Google Doc is single cell genomics technologies, and the one that really sort of um, you know, went viral was single cell RNA sequencing over the, that's, that's really happened over the past decade. And what's happening now is that um, that's, it's, it's becoming possible to actually sequence other modalities in single cells, even at the same time. So starting with DNA, going on to the epigenome, so open chromatin attack sequencing, um, methylated regions in the DNA, the RNA, and then also um, even proteins in parallel with site seq, so with antibody uh, oligonucleotide um, conjugated antibody sequencing. Um, so that's that's definitely one way of profiling single cells in high throughput. Um, the other way to profile proteins in a highly parallel, high throughput way is mass cytometry. So um, I think that's what's meant by mass spec. Um, Matthew, if you could add that into the Google Doc or kind of data types that I can think of. So essentially the data type is either a, uh, a molecular mass or it's a sequencing readout. Um, I don't know how technical we want to get in terms of data types. Um, for me, that's kind of enough. Ambrose, you might be interested in kind of nitty gritty data formats and that kind of thing. I don't know whether we actually need to go there. Um, I'll let you, let the peep, the participants kind of guide us with respect to that. Um, would anyone li else like to add more on single cells? We are starting to add like, not me, but people in Paris, uh, biophysical properties. So they measure, for instance, tensions in cells, so in embryos or others. So they also try to understand in an organ what are the tensions between cells. So like some kind of, so they do also atomic force microscopy, so that type of uh, data. So it could be an isolated cell, but also in an organ, which well, also gives a map. Cool. So I would call them kind of like, because there's also electrophysiology in single cells, right? Like patch seek kind of thing, like patch clamp plus sequencing in single cells. Yeah. So should for we some cells, for some cells, yeah. like yeah, for some, for well, you can yeah, you could you could do it almost on any cell. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, should we call those kind of like functional or biophysical? Maybe biophysical. Modalities. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you could add them, Matthew, that would be awesome. Um, yep. I do satellite measurements as well. So, and Andrew Grace, I, th I think in the heart context, the way it's arisen is initially through anatomy and histology. And for example, the sinus node, the normal pacemaker, like a spindly cell, and then patch clamp came, and then now genetics. So the gene, the RNA, is downstream. The, it, it, it's, it's come from anatomical. Um, and then physiological outputs, biophysical outputs, in, and including cell tension and things like that, onto now the potential for RNA and looking at what the determinants are of the structure and function of the cell. So I think that's how, the, how it's arisen hist um, historically, as it were. Which so, has relevance. So, so, taking think, it, yeah. so, so slowly, taking it slowly. So we've talked about the RNA. So what you've added is histology, which I would say is kind of like 
microscopy and, and morphology information from microscopy that you can, yes. you can sort of capture that in a quantitative way through image processing. Yeah. And then you mentioned, you, you said something else as well. Uh, well the patch clamp and, 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 physic, uh, and electrophysiological yes. measurements, which you mentioned yes. earlier. Yeah, okay. But I think, you know, from the point of view of people who come from that more, I guess, physiological world, I mean, they're looking for explanations of how this, these things have arisen. And whether it's the histology and the microscopy, the appearance and the physiology, and yet they have information on some of the single cell properties looking backwards, possibly, right. in terms of morphology and certainly patch single cell EP in the cardiac context, I think is 78, something like that. It goes back quite a while. Single yeah. cell patch camp studies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. I mean, we can talk a bit more about kind of imaging and morphology. Um, because, the, you know, there is a lot of scope um, that I see for integration um, with imaging modalities um, of single cells. Would anyone else like to talk more about that? Because I'm not the can best I, Can I chime in? Yes, please. Um, so, to me, the data type for single cells, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I see tables, right? Data tables? You have cells and then a measurement, genes or proteins, even electrophysiological -physio measurements. And you, one would think, oh yeah, you have a new mode of measurement, you just add a column, right, to that table. But when we're talking about integration, it doesn't really work that way because although there are technologies that can measure things in multiple modalities, but we're not talking about every single modality. It's usually one or two modalities at the same time. So if we're talking about integration, then how do we bring these modalities together? It, for example, ele electrophysiology with, um, with, with genomics, for example. I think that's a point of discussion I would like to have. Yeah, so, so I would say there are, you know, you raise a good point. So there are two different things. One thing is defining data types that can be gathered for each taxonomy level. So for single cells, what are the data types that can be gathered um, independently? And, and then the second question is, to what extent can they be integrated? So I was kind of um, rolling those two things into one, for instance, when I was talking about the single cell genomics, and I said, you know, we have the different levels, the DNA, epigenomics, transcriptomics, protein. And it's becoming increasingly feasible to actually measure multiple modalities from the same single cell. But that may not, that may not be the case for all modalities. So I think for the patch seq is an example where, you, where like there is electrophysiology plus sequencing of transcriptomics on a single cell, but it may not always be possible. So we can just record these things. We can record these data types independently and then we can talk about to what extent it's possible or not possible to integrate them. That's, that, you know, the, Um, would anybody like to add more on single cell imaging modalities? So we've got here single cell. So we've got single, for instance, some of the notes that, that Christine and Joe and I had were single particle cryolium, which is, I mean, single particle is more about large protein complexes, I would say. Then there's, then there's tomography, um, electron, microscopy and, and tomography, cryo and tomography, which, which is very cool um, because it essentially describes, you know, the morphology of each single cell, including organelles. And basically now some of the resolution is even going down, down to ribosomes and, you know, large complexes, which is kind of mind blowing and beautiful. And, um, what what I don't see at the moment is that thing that Ken was mentioning is how we can integrate that with the genomics, unless it's kind of population level, but it won't be for that single specific single cell. But that's fine. We can still record, you know, these modalities um, and then think about whether they're, it would be nice, like a nice thought experiment to think about whether they're in an ideal world, would there be some way that we could achieve integration? Do you think chromatin would be possible? As in integration, kind of like that, that bottleneck or something to combine those modalities. I mean, getting the transcriptome out of, 
uh, cryo EM or tomography would be top right, but chromatin architecture. I mean, you'd have to have some foothold in knowing, you know, which locus you're looking at, but yeah. I, I don't know. I That's haven't cool idea. You know, analyzed this data beyond just marbling at beautiful idea. images. It's maybe a small <laughs> so, point, Sarah, um, but I would yep, say that the multiplex immunostaining has had some success as an intracellular technology as well. I'm just thinking yep. about the Pelkman's work. Yep, I completely right. agree. Yeah, and I, I think that method might also be something where at least some of the cryo EM or X-ray tomography um, essays might be integrated um, across to those modalities because you could use, in theory, antibody staining that is marked with um, ions or like heavy metal ions or something like that, that actually allow for, for counter staining in those, in those samples. But I don't think that is very advanced at this stage. So I will add, add this. No, I think that's a really good point. Um, so that's basically the fact that you could do the cryo EM with immunostaining like with metals for instance yeah so like with the idea that you use a with marker set, labeled antibody or something that, like that. yeah that is a marker set that is can be used both let's say in the genomics data set coming from the yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, i'm with you the, um, actually yeah, matthew really did, really did our scribe understand that i think that's very exciting did our scribe understand that um i may have put a sentence in there okay. somebody will have to sort of double check to make sure i captured the um um, I guess the, the sort of idea. Um, yeah, I think it's not only cryo EM. I think there are like some methods that just use basically EM. Uh, I think uh, like large, like relatively large, um, large sections um, for EM. And I think those might cryo EM might be on a resolution that is often like subcellular resolution. I don't see how the like how that would map really well. Um, well, just well, I think it I think it could work because you can then map the, you know, where the fluorescence microscopy, like the Pelkman's type data, would mm -hmm. look, and you can kind of infer how how the um, the metal labeled antibody looks per cell. If you the, the thing is that you have to have a plexity there. Yeah, it, it, or maybe it, even it, 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 like a large population. I think to kind of like get the population distribution of the signal really yeah. well. Um, so if you want, and I think the cryo EM won't have like such a huge sub, like sampling of the cell population. Yeah. FibSim would, would probably be very good. FibSim, so the, the correlative with the fluorescence and then the, the EM. I don't know what the relative resolution is like with some, um, maybe some like, a little bit. So that's scanning electron microscopy. Could you tell us a little uh, bit about how that technique works, Jonah? Because uh, no, no, I'm it's 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 thing. transmission. So you you do um, just okay. like very very high level and understanding here. So you uh, you can take fluorescence images, including now like live movies, and then fix and process for tomography. And then using the fluorescence, I think, for registration and to understand, you know, which cells and even some subcellular structures. So, for example, I've seen a few examples where, like, Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz has labeled the ER and looked at ER dynamics. And then you can use your tomography. And then the integration of those data types is, is clearly hard and, like, extremely computationally intensive, but now possible, right? I mean, people are, are doing it in Harold Hess and others, I think, in particular. Um, and right, so it allows you to enlarge populations of cells, identify either cells or process, subcellular processes within those cells that have been fluorescently tagged, and then do the, the traditional tomography. And um, I, I don't know exactly which type of tomography is being used, but I think they're, they're pushing it pretty far. So, you know, down to the resolution where they've looked at, there was a, a beautiful example that I saw recently of um, the, the, um, like T cell killing and looking at the, the immunological synapse. Um, so like very, very cool. That's but you can like directly, like and I think you many, can use. So basically you get morphology information about the cell and how many informations about how many specific proteins would you be able to collect in parallel per single cell? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't remember, but I, th I think because it's fluorescent, at least three or four, 
with just traditional fluorescence. So not ideal, but you know, assuming you could use one of these multiplex methods like 4i or others that um, yeah. Simon Ambrose mentioned and kind of get it down to a smaller panel, it, at the very least you could probably get to coarse cell types or you know, within tissue yeah. different. Um, yeah. No, that's interesting. I mean, maybe someday those things will come together. Um, yeah. And then, so um, does anybody else, would anybody else like to talk about so, so we've talked about YEM and tomography methods. Um, we've talked about single cell genomics, mass cytometry. Um, we've talked about kind of functional biophysical electrophysiological measurements at single cell level. Um, I mean, do we, is there, do we want to add more about just like the fluorescence microscopy type? Um, so this one about there are so many different types uh, or, or um, single molecule, you know, fish methods, mm -hmm. highly multiplex methods and so on. Shall we go on to that next? I'm just uh, wondering Ken, what about, yeah. what about the, the time axis because you know, all these atlas, atlas efforts right now is focused on sort of st static snapshots. But if you're talking about fluorescent microscopy that you can image in real time, for example, um, you know, lattice light sheet microscopy, where you can image large, large volumes um, of tissue and organoids and so forth, that would give you a time dimension, which I think would be informative. Um, yeah, that is pretty cool. I mean, to my knowledge, all of those methods are, they're not very multiplex in terms mm -hmm. of how many molecules they read out at the same time. Right. But yeah, that, you, that is. Yeah, it's, a, but if it's sorry. live, it's not, if it's live, it's not really multiplex, but if it's fixed, of course, if you do light shit, then you can do uh, mm -hmm. potentially many. Yep. So um, do you want to talk a little bit about imaging? So. So light sheet, clearly Allah is a, a massive expert in light sheet on fixed tissue. Um, I would say there the, that, that's taking us more up to, to like a higher level because the strength, in my opinion, as far as I can tell, kind of is more the, the large volumes imaging, not so much the, the single cell resolution, which we're focusing on right now. Would you agree? It's, it depends. Like, uh... It used to be the case because of the resolution in the past, but now um, the new light sheet we got before the lockdown, uh, we have a 20x objective on it, which has a very long also working distance. So we can image at 20x resolution in one centimeter thick uh, sample over like six uh, square centimeters. So it's quite, uh, quite large. There was this paper by Ali Archuk's group where they use a prototype uh, of this microscope for a paper in cell and they could image a whole like human kidney, adult human kidney. So it gives you that now you can go from like a whole kidney to even like a 20 X resolution inside the kidney itself. And what you're trying to do is to try to see now whether you can image in 3D. We know we can reprocess the sample after the staining is done in 3D and you can do sections and do like all types of staining on it. So now the idea is can we recombine at the end the 2D section where if you use that technique such as the Maxima or similar technique, we can do multiplex uh, cyclic immunostaining, so 30, 300 markers at a time, and then we map it to the 3D image. So, and of course, there is a lot of uh, computation behind, a lot of need to uh, develop ways to, to analyze and uh, recombine everything. And for now, the solution that exists, the good one, they are mostly commercial, so it's, uh, it's expensive. Uh, so there, there will be a need to, to get people working on, on, on this. Uh, so, but the, the, you can go from, as I said, whole organ to like a single cell in the organ and go to cytoskeleton if you wish, or organelles. No, that sounds pretty cool. So how does he get, so in, I'm just looking up that, what you're saying is the example of the kidney from, from Ali's lab. So how does, how does he get the staining into the, for, the for thick now, volume? For, for now, what, so what, what you can do is you can perfuse the organ, so right, that's so what you do, selecting. Okay. But or then you, you can, can also, 
right? Because then you effectively you need to have like a live organ on a perfusion. No, no, no. No. no, 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 it's okay because you can take it postmortem and then you perfuse in the vessels and then you get stainings. Uh, so yeah, for it, now, but even we don't fix it though, it's fresh then, right? No, you fix it. Take it post so, you fix yeah, it. Yeah, you, okay. you, you can perfuse and then you can perfuse and incubate with the, uh, with the, uh, the dye. And also, you can also use like, um, that's why also it could be for some uh, things, you can just use also autofluorescence. So you play with your lasers and then you use the physic, uh, physical properties of the cells. And then you can see like a vasculature, you can see cell types sometimes just based on the physical properties. So how, how do they react to green light, blue light, etc. So so that's what he used for his paper. So just you push the background and that's it. So so it won't work with very cell type, but at least you get, get an idea of some some features. And that's maybe why some uh, physicists, they can help by like putting on this type of technologies, some kind of uh, uh, physical parameters or ways to identify cell types based on their physical properties in 3D. So, yeah, I mean that's that's really cool because that's a way of getting from the right from the single cell all the way to the essentially the whole organ. Yeah. So kind of structurally and in terms of mapping. And and there's no complex. I mean, there is a lot of complex computation, but it's a direct. You know, so you've got the direct link right in the measurement because you've got the single cell resolution, and you've got the whole organ. So it's not like having to integrate MRI with single cell genomics or something like that. You have everything together. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. What, what we're trying to see is whether we can even dissociate nuclei from the organ after we did the clearing. We know we protect the mRNA, we know the DNA is there, but we don't know whether we can make a dissociation, a cell suspension, and eventually do some kind of basic analysis of the cells in suspension. So, but maybe it's possible. We know. We should know soon, um, at some point. <laughs> Which papers that you were talking about? The one from Ali, it's in Cell and it was Oh, it's published. in February in Cell, yeah. It's what is they call it? Chanel. Chanel with an S. S H A N E L. Okay. Yeah, I see it. I see it. Okay. So the images are again it's the first paper, so it's not uh, amazing yet. It's I mean it's the quite but it's still quite uh, technically um, now we can image six by two by three, so almost fifteen fifteen to sixteen cubic centimeters. Yeah, no, that is very cool because that is kind of, that is essentially, essentially a whole organ kind of volume. Yeah, I mean, it shows in the paper, you can clear the whole brain, human yeah, brain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I found a cellular and microprobing of intact human organs, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Mm hmm very cool. Just for okay, so that's that's um that's good. Oh, thank you, Matthew. To thank you for <laughs> for pasting that. Um, I have a question. Like when we talk about the actually going back, basically defining this data types for each taxonomy level. Um, you know, how much is that of defining the? I mean, how much are these data types used to define the taxonomy, and how much is it to characterize it? Right. I mean. I guess not all of them are needed to define the taxonomy really, or well, ideally not, because it seems like that's like what we are aiming for here. It's like a comprehensive characterization of basically all molecular features in a cell, as opposed to we can group the cells already meaningfully into cellular taxonomies beforehand. And maybe it will be useful to break that up, sort of like what are, what are methods that can establish a taxonomy meaningfully and the methods that can characterize them, because maybe in that way, we don't have to have always like a one-to-one -one mapping between the two. I mean, sort of if, if we are not aiming to have like a, like a fully comprehensive atlas with all molecular features combined on, on one data set, it might be used, it might be possible to just define taxonomies with a subset of these methods and define the cellular features with another, um, with another method. Yep. Yep. Um, so 
So, so if I understand you correctly, what you're saying um, is basically um, you know that that that, 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 there, that there's an overarching kind of cellular yeah. organ anatomical taxonomy, and that the methods basically kind of stitch onto that. I mean, yeah. I so so I, so I agree with that. I think the thing, the reality that that we're facing at the moment. Say, if you take the kidney, you know, which I think you've worked on, um, then it's it's that different modalities for so people who specialize in different techniques, they mm -hmm. discover different cell states, let's say, and then they, um, you know, they they call them different names and so on, and then. You know, sometimes it's ambiguous. Let's say if you have an imaging technology and a genomics technology, it's ambiguous how they how they stitch together. Do you, do you, do you see what I mean? So although no, I, I like theoretically, it sounds brilliant what you're saying, but I think in reality, no, I I totally understand what you're saying. I think it goes back to what I think you wrote in the white paper is about you know if the map becomes as expansive as the actual landscape, um, you know, it's there's not like that much use of the map. I think like it would be good to have like a, you know, different levels of abstraction um, somehow. Yeah. That guide that taxonomy maybe. Yeah. So Amy is, has stuck something in. Um, do you want to add to the discussion, Amy? Um, I can. I just wanted to um, point out that for brain, one of the things that um, particularly Jeremy Miller at the Allen Institute, I helped him a little bit, but a lot of people at the Allen Institute worked on was a little narrative. I think it's showing up now in a number of different white papers for a um, rubric around how we, how we were defining the taxonomies we were using for transcriptomic grouping, where one of the intents of the rubric was to do it in a way where it could be applied to any kind of data modality for which there was some sort of a reference data set. So that it sort of breaks down, um, and, and none of us are taxonomists or ontologists, so it's sort of done from the biologist perspective of this, but um, it was identifying the components of what would be needed, getting back to this idea of you need to have some sort of reference data set and you need to have some sort of uh, analysis description of what was done on that reference data set to then map things to a taxonomy. And so it's sort of, um, this came out of a workshop that we had specifically talking about cell taxonomic classifications for brain um, using transcriptomic data that was actually co-sponsored by CZI. And um, as part of that, it became clear to us that there wasn't gonna be, you know, it, well, it's clear to everybody, there's not gonna be one solution that applies to everything, but that there can maybe be these sort of overlapping methods. And that was where um, we just described what we were essentially doing for nomenclature associated with what we were doing with brain and then put out our description in a way where we're curious if other people could use that too for other modalities. So I just throw that out there because um, it's, uh, we, we haven't had people, we haven't people, we haven't had people say, yeah, we love this, but we haven't had people knock it down either. And so um, I think one of the questions is, how, you know, to what extent does one implement to it, no matter what solution you have, how do you implement that? How do you get it moving forward in terms of um, not just community adoption, but getting feedback on something that crosses multiple different modalities and multiple different organ systems, and then multiple different states, like whether it's development state or, you know, state change over time, any of those. So I just yeah. put that out there because, um, you know, it'd be useful if, if people aren't aware of it. Yeah. If there's feedback to be had, there it is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, I think that's super, that's super helpful. And, and I think, you know, the dimension of cell state and, and also the fact that it can change, you know, for a given cell over time, I think that's, it's, it's quite hard to encode. Um, it's, it's really it's hard. I, don't, I haven't seen that. what yeah. successfully. What, so I'm just having a look at that page and, you know, thank you for sticking that in there because I hadn't actually seen this before. What, how, what do you think, like how the EBI cell ontology database kind of, you know, do you, are you familiar with that? Do you think it's a useful framework or do you think it's kind of barking up the wrong tree? Um, I mean, I think there are all, all ontologies I've seen are useful frameworks, all of them. I think that the test keeps coming back with to what extent are they um, 
usable by other groups or in other modalities. And so EBI, like the last time I looked at it, um, it, it, was, it was less clear to me how then that was going to be extensible by everyone. Um, but that, that's my own limit. That's not the limit of the data. That was because I hadn't gone through that process. I think yeah. for one of the things we sort of aggregated around after this workshop that we'd had on cell types was that, you know, additional governance is necessary. <laughs> and I, there's, there's an effort underway um, for a grant to apply to something that seems sort of dry around what would that governance look like, something that's the equivalent of, you know, an NCBI style or an EBI style approach to the governance that would go with organization. And so I, I don't see that that's for EBI. I don't see that that exists for any, any approach yet, but I might have missed it. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree. I mean, the, what we, <coughs> it, 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 it is very, it's not very intuitive. And so the EBI cell ontology, I think, is meant more for other databases users. It's not meant for the end user, if that makes sense. So it's more like a framework with a code base that then other people can use for their specific application. But I'm just wondering whether it can be adapted, you know, to to uh, to, to what we are talking about: human cells, human cell taxonomies, and like very, you know, more concrete sort of. Use yeah, cases. I mean, the the one we were working on too has the um, you know, the added disadvantage of it starts with the assumption too that if you treat cell types like we think of RefSeq IDs, where everything has an ID and the cell type is the ID and then the alias becomes the things that people commonly like to ascribe to the properties that they're comfortable with, whether, you know, what, whatever the, the working vernacular is for that cell type, but that the actual defining component is going to be some sort of a unique identifier. And yeah. that's where right now there's you know, there's a stumbling point for the field and getting past the idea that there's going to be some sort of unifying analysis mechanism that provides that identifier. And so that's essentially what we were working toward. We're saying, and that makes a few assumptions. It's saying, okay, people have to agree to the fact that there's a transcriptomic base element for that kind of analysis. Um, recognizing it's not the whole picture, that that needs to be there at least in some way, or there needs to be enough of a um, a mapping mechanism where you can get to that point because that would allow you to, to generate said identifier. Um, or if you don't have that identifier, you need to have a really well characterized mechanism for uh, creating a, a data accessible, computable uh, framework for organizing your cell types. And, you know, I've worked with Clay Reed and we were trying to get there certainly for EM level data for the brain. Um, but that's that's the challenge for a lot of different fields. Yeah. No, well, that's really helpful. So I guess one, one thing that this, so what we don't have here is, so, he, so I, I mean, I guess we've got me here from kind of Sanger reaching across to EBI and human cells and so on. You know, we've got you, Amy, from, and I, are you, yeah, I mean, you must be in the NIH Brain Initiative and Allen Institute and Brain. Actually kind of not, well, I'm peripheral to the NIH Brain Initiative, but I'm close enough. And I work a lot with Ed and with other people who are. And, and then, so, 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 so you, you know, but then the one, the other group that's been working on that in Human Atlas is Peter Karchenko, Fabian Tais, and making um, a sort of, um, uh, like a common kind of workspace, like a Wikipedia type crowdsourcing type thing for cell annotation. Um, I mean, I wonder whether, you know, whether there's scope as a kind of croc, crocs up or whatever output from this, from this group um, to, you know, to basically have a, a cross, um, basically more liaising amongst those groups. That would be an awesome crux up. Um, I know there's a lot of liaising already around those groups. And I think part of the challenge is, is uh, 
yeah, I mean, it's, it's human beings. So yeah, yeah. I know yeah. for, I know that there is a large grant that's been applied for through NIH that tries to get at developing community around this. There's also the two sort of highly related, but maybe unreconciled factions that are working with the data-driven component of computing and understanding classifiers that are extensible and usable, like where you apply that function, which is, uh, which is the angle that we've sort of been taking. And then there's the desire to provide sort of the infinitely expandable community annotation component to all features that are known about cells, which is also critical, but in some ways a little at odds to this, it's complementary, but they're two different things. And that's where yeah. Peter's been very focused on generating that kind of a platform yeah. and that approach. Exactly. So the, the, so team the cell ontology is more the top down and the other way is more the bottom up data yes. driven. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And and I, I agree. I agree that there's those two. I wouldn't call right them now They're also both either. falling into these classes of they're all trying to like drum up funding um, yeah. and huge grants and big communities, giant working groups. So, so there's work there and I am, I am outside of that, like by choice. Yeah. So, uh, so I know that Ed and Peter and Mike Horowitz um, and, and pulling in people who are more familiar with the, the annotation or the um, ontology world, like Chris Mungal, David Osumi Sutherland, they're, they're, all, they're all spun up in this. Um, but I highlight it because I think it is still going to come down to what sort of applications and utilities are going to move people forward and people are going to adopt to use for their work. And that requires that you put something out there uh, where people have all this data now, not three years from now, where there's a governance mechanism, which is part of what we're needing as well. Um, and so that that's just, you know, I throw out a little bit of what we've done, recognizing that there are a lot of other approaches as well. Yeah, no, that's massively helpful. Thank you, Amy. Um, can I just ask Jonah, but, you know, I don't want to spend too long on the cell, cell and, you know, cell annotation taxonomy and so on in case in case other people aren't interested but can i just ask jonah for um a quick perspective from where he stands and from what he's seen from the funding side and comment on this this field and this challenge sure so i, th I think it's a really exciting challenge um and so a, a few things so one i think you know people are obviously struggling with it across different organs and, and networks the work and the paper that um, Amy was referring to from Ed and others, I think it was called like the Copenhagen group. Is that, there's this. That's yet another one. So that's okay, another so one. And that's, that's one of the other. So that's Rafa Yuste and Ed and others worked on this Copenhagen paper. Yeah. That's basically the position piece saying we really need to do something to bring everybody together. Right. And then there was the meeting to kind of like develop an early implementation and yeah, I, I think I think this one thing that would be really helpful is uh, for Ed and others to almost try to create like a Cliff's Notes guide for some of this. And I say that because uh, the lung groups are, have been, you know, working with Ed or getting some input. And I think we're really inspired after realizing that he had done or, you know, the, this group had started doing this within the brain and the cortex community. And I think there's actually a pretty rapid way to kind of like help mobilize and provide just some guidance and you know a, a working framework um, for how to start to think about these ontological challenges and you know what works what doesn't work with existing ontologies and you know how to integrate new high dimensional data types into redefining cell types and using them um, so I think there's a really good possibility that I think you know from my perspective has actually been very effective as kind of a grassroots thing that with a little bit of structure and framework from Ed, folks like Jay Rajagopal and Sasha Masharan and Pascal and Martine were really pretty rapidly able to pull together this, this meeting uh, this summer and I think start to you know, mature their thoughts um, very, very quickly. So I mean that, you know, I see those things, Jonah, as kind of, yeah, how can I put it kind of, um, essentially those are those efforts sort of populate the ontology right they're yep. populating it and they're populating it from a, a fantastic kind of expert point of view mm -hmm. um, I guess maybe maybe we shouldn't just shouldn't get too hung up on like philosophies of you know top-down ontology versus grassroots and stuff like that and just just do it just do it yeah and, and just you know have all these these the the seed networks and the HCA 
biological networks in the communities, you know, develop their expert kind of annotations and then the structures will kind of organize themselves, whether there's a hierarchical kind of formal ontology or whether there's more, you know, like a, um, a sort of commons annotation um, and, and maybe that will just evolve and we shouldn't get too hung up on that yeah. sort of philosophically. I, I think it does help that's, to that's tease, apart, tease apart annotations from taxonomy from ontologies, because I think it, at times they start to get yeah. conflated, yeah. not to say that they're, they're separable, but um, you know, in the same way that I think maybe in the last couple of years we've gone through this with like data integration, that it, it can mean kind of at once a lot of different things to different people and you know, trying to refer to yeah. specific tasks as you know, batch correction or something like this uh, yeah. can be more helpful. I guess, like, I guess you need annotation to, 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 to populate an ontology. And the annotation and the ontology can be organized in a taxonomy or not. Or how do you, how do you see the relationships between those terms? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think the sequencing is, is interesting, but I'm thinking of like, for example, maybe a normal workflow where, you know, someone is looking at a bunch of cells or T-SNE and differential expression and trying to pick out marker genes. And that may have a certain ontological term associated with, a, you know, a string of gene expression, um, but maybe it doesn't necessarily have to. If you're just, I mean, I don't know. It's so ontology is more formal, whereas annotation is less formal, basically. I, I think that, so. Yeah, I think that's what I'm trying to say, or what I'm going towards. I don't know if others yeah. agree. I think okay, it's. Would anybody else like to chime in before we move on? Oh, just uh, that Becky Steck yeah, just ahead. joined. Becky Steck just joined, and she's been very involved in some of the kidney precision medicine project, um, both annotation and ontology development and taxonomy development. So I just highlight that that's another voice in the mix. Sorry to throw you in there, Becky, because you yeah. just showed up. But there was <laughs> there's a conversation that's actually winding down now about um, sequencing and sort of interdependencies of thinking about taxonomy, ontology, infrastructure, and then operationally, how do we get to a point where there's sort of a, an action, a path forward for, um, for mobilizing to use what is usable? All right, let me pull up your notes then. I got into your Zoom, but I haven't pulled up your notes yet, but I'll take a peek. Sarah, do you think that, I mean, I'm just thinking through that last comment, do you think that all of those tasks, even if they're kind of being parsed in some way, have to be considered together? Or is there kind of a, step, a stepwise or separate, Amy as well, I, mean, I think both of you have thought about this and worked on these problems quite a bit. Um, sorry, Jonah, apologies, but I just missed the question. Sorry, um, so you know, my, my parsing of the different tasks, so annotation of trying to take you know, high dimensional data and identify what the defining features of it are to ontologies of what you then call, you know, a cell type or the, you know, collections based on those features and then taxonomy of the relationships among them. Do they yeah. have to be considered all together or do you think that it's possible to parse them and, you know, think about, you know, assuming no, no, communication. No, it's possible to think about them separately. It's possible to okay. think about them separately, but I just want to get your your view on how you see them relating to each other. Okay. Did Becky want to say something? Uh, I'm, I'm still catching up to the conversation, but uh, <laughs> so apologies. But I overall, I would say that based on what I read, I do think that um, it, it, this is maybe just saying something super obvious. So I'll say this and stand down, which is just you got to keep your eyes on, you know, wide, but then you still should focus in on something. Right. So, I mean, you, it's nice to know what's going on, but you know, at this point, it sounds like there may be analysis paralysis if we try to boil the ocean. Um, and I think I got an, like every work metaphor there. So, um, uh, but yeah, it, it just looks like, I mean, I think Jonah, you were asking, do we have to do all of this or should we do it in pieces? And I would, my, my general approach is in pieces, um, but not with blinders on. Um, my experience is also that it's, it's not gonna be sequential, it's iterative. So, it, you know, in all of these, there's, there's needing to circle back up and back down or laterally. Um, 
Yeah. And that, that's actually one of the reasons why sort of it, it's not an engineering problem as much as a sociology problem, because we want to think of these things as thought through and then done and then move on. And that's just not, you know, that's not the, the nature of how these kinds of analysis yeah. questions work. So that's uh, pragmatic. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's totally what Amy said. <laughs> I would maybe chime in there just on the engineering versus sociology problem to, to echo that and say that if you did want to design an engineering solution, Sarah, per your earlier comment about should it be top down or should it be grassroots? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are ways to structure these types of projects that facilitate collaboration. And just from listening to this group and to another group earlier, it seems like people are coming up with new use cases and new problems. Um, Ed Lean pointed out, for example, that uh, most of the brain annotations and cell typing has been done based on post mitotic cells. But now when you start to think about development, there's a whole different way of thinking about classifications and taxonomies. And so designing technical solutions that are flexible at this point in time would be the right path. Yeah, oh, that's, very, that's very sensible. Okay, I think we've got time. So should we move up now? So we've been focusing very strongly on single cells and single cell taxonomy and well, you know, topics to do with annotation, ontology, taxonomy, technologies on single cell. Can I kind of take us up now to tissue, kind of microanatomical yeah. level can, can I, and one, can, organ can I, level? Uh, please? please, yeah, Alain. Yeah, yeah so there's, there's one thing we discussed and there's still nothing really uh, focusing on this is all the microscopy data and images. So, uh, like, us and others are starting to generate like terabytes of images as we explained in the past. Uh, so we, I don't think there's a common uh, format that was agreed on by everyone uh, generating images for the Atlas. And also we don't know where to put them. So we are storing them on our, uh, on our own servers for now. Um, so is there a plan uh, at some point to store the data on a common uh, portal? Should we compress them? And if we compress them, uh, what should be the compression standard that everyone agrees? Like if I start compressing my data, maybe then you're gonna tell me, ah, oh, it's nice, but they're not use useful for us. So it's mean, something- We are facing the same kind of like problem that, you know, in, in, the, in the, well, not right this second, but in the kind of medium to long term, we'll be facing this, that the storage becomes so expensive. So is there, is there a plan to organize something around this like image data, like acquisition standard, uh, uh, how we manage or we navigate through the data sets? Uh, so wh what we should do when we, we make uh, new, I mean, new images? So, so my two cents, but I, I'm, not, I'm not a super expert, but like my feeling basically at this point is what will be ideal would be if there's some kind of way of compressing the data into, you know, for, for your type of data, the light sheet, you know, compressing it into se segmentation of cells and then quantification of, of expression levels per cell. And then basically where that cell sits in three dimensions. Yeah. That would already be a useful This we can do. This we can do, it just I'm afraid that at some point someone from elsewhere or consortium will decide that it's not the good compression uh, algorithm. We should have compressed not in JPEG, but in JPEG 2000 yeah. or not compressed at all. So it just, it would be good at some point to uh, a discussion between people to define what should be the uh, uh, standard or something that is acceptable for so Amy everyone Bonner at the end. No, don't compress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. The problem is it's expensive not to do that, Amy. I know, but, but be warned. So we went through this whole thing for so much of our Allen Institute data, and we agonized over it, and we had all these different levels, and we still get all this flamey mail from people that think that we committed some sort of atrocity to science because we selected on and committed a compression uh, standard that we had to do to fit our data. You know, it was purely dollars and cents at the time, where people now are like, how can you, you know, it's misconduct that we don't have the raw data. Why don't we have the raw data available? Because they would like to use their algorithms and we have all this lost data. Well, it was money. It was money. We didn't have, we didn't have money to, to put it somewhere, but people are now very, very critical of certain of our data sets for which they see this as some sort of 
you know, giant flaw you know, of misconduct that's, level. That's so, exactly my, That's exactly what I said. Is is yeah. now if I start compressing, then people are going to tell me that I shouldn't have compressed them. But then where, if I want to store my, uh, I don't know, eighty. Uh, are we going to generate in for one of our projects five hundred terabytes minimum of images over two years? So if I have to put them in a cloud system accessible to everyone, it's going to cost minimum two hundred fifty thousand euros per year uh, to my lab to make the, the data accessible. So yeah, and there's no yeah. way there's no way I can pay for it. So either we just put them on the server and it's like uh, inaccessible or yeah. uh, I will have to compress them. So that's that's what I meant. There's a need to have something on, on large scale uh, yeah. uh, because otherwise no one will be able to use our data sets. Yeah. Yep, I, I recognize the problem um, and it's, the, it's, you know, we're gonna be in the same place very, very soon. Does anybody have any solutions? No, I have massive have email campaign to Jeff Bezos. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not a solution. I think that it should be a uh, kind of like the Cliff Notes comment, actually. That I think whatever you know, you're you're going to have to do some sort of compression for the money. And I would recommend that you write a little narrative at the time that you make that choice of you know that essentially walks back why you did it, what was the best practices there, how you're extracting the key features that you want. So at the end of the day, you want to segment the cells and you're doing that for the purpose of quantifying the cells. And this yeah. is the best method of getting that cell data. So the rest people have to see is just lost. And, and yeah. I think having a little description of that in some way, shape or form, at least captures in time where you can look back on that because people will then say, why can't you give me that data? I want that data. And you've published on this data. It should be open, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But, oh, I, but I see what you're saying. something that walks through what the, what the, state, of the yeah. state of the decision is that you can always point back to. Because I wish that I'd written that like for myself all the time. Yeah. Because we threw out data that we had to throw out. We got rid of raw data. And then we also did a little example where we saved a couple of examples of here was you know, here was the raw data, here was the process data, here are the methods that we used for that. And so here's sort of the provenance of that decision making. Um, and, that, and that we kind of keep that so that when people do ask, why can't I have all your data? It's because of the cost. It's because you're able to extract out the unit of measure that you want, which is at the cell level. And anything beyond that is beyond the scope of the project, which sounds heartless and it's not a solution, but, but it's a practical reality of the world we live in. And I think we were receiving that criticism were there any like real nuggets of wisdom in there from people who were wondering or who were providing alternative solutions or were they mostly just like I want and my algorithm requires? It's exactly that. It's, I want my algorithm requires. Or, okay. um, you know, we get a, a massive quantity of, of requests of people who say, I want all your data and you have to give it to me. Yeah. And, and, you okay, know, it's, it's petabytes, petabytes of data. Like, where do you even put it? So, um, you know, on the one hand, we want the data to be reusable, obviously. And so your, your immediate response is sort of guilt and misery when, <laughs> when you can't provide that. But it has costs associated with it. And you can't anticipate all of those costs. You know, what is the research we wouldn't have been able to do had we had to then find that data storage? So you come back to the purpose for which the data was generated. And I, do, I don't know what to do. But yeah, Ambrose, your point, the, the, usually it's, I, I have a new thing and I want to play with it. However, we have this problem right now where we have a giant glioblastoma data set that the images were compressed. And we now have people that want to do even finer uh, analysis of the data using machine learning algorithms that the compressed data is now just beyond the scale at which, or beyond the resolution at which it would have been useful for some of those ML algorithms that people want to use. You know, it's a tragedy. We had this data, it's now compressed and we don't, we, we don't have any way of going back to the raw and we keep getting this feedback. People say, well, we'll pay for it. We'll pay, we'll pay for the raw data. It, that doesn't help. We just don't have it. So um, I don't think there's a, a simple solution, but, but I, there's a range. But couldn't of we, couldn't we organize at some point uh, some kind of meeting or one day meeting for people who are generating images? Because if we define, like if I want to map cell type in an embryo, based on uh, immunofluorescence for transition factors. I can compress my data. You can do cell count with zero problem. So we could define for various type of tasks or 
or e type of images what we want to compression that are accepted by producers. Try to, to find a way to, uh, to accept that type of analysis, this compression that we all agree on, they're enough. Okay, so so it, it would be good because I, I, otherwise I don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> So if we can source from the grid on, on, on criteria and compression stuff, then we can say it was a discussion between people and we all agree on this and that's it. Yeah, I, I think that's I, a really good point. I had a brief because then there's more ahead, kind sorry. of... No, sorry, Ambrose. I'm gonna I was going to say, CZ, I had a very brief foray into exploring image formats when we were looking at the various types of image-based transcriptomics assays. The question that we were asking then is, you know, who should we go talk to to learn from? And our answer was the astronomy community and the machine learning community. To, to what extent do you two, Elaine and Amy, think that those communities might have an answer for us? I mean, I talk to those communities as well. <laughs> So back yeah. when we did this for, for the connectivity atlas that we did, when we've done it for EM, um, the, a lot of these, the difference is that there's, um, there's more sort of government level underwriting for a lot of this, but they, they hold it and it's expensive and it's usually the US government coming from a different pile of money. Um, but then in some cases, um, yeah, I mean, it, it depends. It's, it's a, it's a, it's the same problem, but a different set of sort of sociological drivers behind it and different sources of money. Exactly the same for us. If you're a physicist in France, you can get billions to build any kind of telescope. No one uh, cares. You can use the CERN uh, computers. And to, if you come, if you want three billions to sort the images, then we say it's okay. If you're biology, so, so it's I was I was um, I was passing uh, the a village called Barton outside of Cambridge recently, and um, there's an entire field full of enormous radio astronomy micro um, dishes that must have cost like probably hundreds of millions, you know. Here, um, I think we need some. We don't have those big like big pieces of physical infrastructure that, that are very obvious. Yeah, and it's, it's more than the physical infrastructure. So, um, you know, we played again a lot with this with the Allen Institute, the concept of the observatory, where you centralize yeah. both the instrumentation as well as the data storage, and then researchers access it. So um, the reality is, at least for biology, certainly for neuroscience, it's very, very distributed. You know, each lab- like We, we a have a more federated community. Exactly. And, and the so strength of our community, I think, I mean, one thing that I learned like from the, the talking, like we should, we should wrap up soon, but this is getting kind of off topic slightly. But the one thing that I learned from that CERN presentation, you know, they've obviously raised the billions, like since the 1950s, the, the weakness of those, of, of that model, is that I think it's hard for junior people to rise up through that very centralized kind of um, very organized institutional sort of structure. And, and, and there's some, I feel like there's also a sort of maybe stifling of creativity because it's then, you know, it's thousands of people that are coordinated and then there's one spokesperson who's usually quite senior and so on. Anyway, that's getting slightly off topic, but that's that. I think that really speaks for our community more, even if we, you know, we maybe don't get as much money. I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether that's actually true in the end. But um. if you look at the overall NIH budget, is it's much higher than NSF or other physics foundation uh, funding, but we obviously have to spread it out over many, many aspects, as you mentioned, the federated aspect. Yeah. Um, back to okay. the, the yeah. type. So we have another 15 minutes, folks. Uh, yeah. We've only got another 15 minutes left. I think the discussion has been amazing. Um, you know, really, really interesting. And I hope you, I hope you agree. And um, not, not everybody has, kind of, um, I think almost everybody has spoken. So that's, that's really good. Um, like without me controlling sort of too much. So that's absolutely fantastic. 
Um, what do we want to put as our like key take home messages, sort of key action points? And does anyone get up, want to get up on the soapbox and present for our group? It doesn't have to be me. It's pretty late here in the UK anyway. I mean, just, just thinking about the robustness of human phenotypic data over time, I think from the clinical sphere, we have got lots of experience in that. Of course, we used to keep paper records about the phenotype of patients, and then we moved to EMR and everything else. But of course, there's bits missing. I don't think we can feel too bad about things that weren't recorded 10 years ago. And even in design of things like Bush Biobank as such, like, you know, lots of discussion about what goes in. And then it evolves over time. And people might complain and say, well, we don't have MRI data of X from five years ago, and it would have been nice to follow this longitudinally. But I don't feel we should, as individuals, or feel too bad. I think it's very defensible. I don't really think it needs that much documentation because people can look back and see what was available at the time. And of course, to co collect it along, you know, reasonable strands and reasonable discussion and a community view has been reached at time X, you know, this is a robust thing. You look back in five years, okay, we could have done it slightly differently. And so, you know, but things move on. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, that's a fair point. So you don't need to feel too bad, Amy. That's people, it. People whinge at you about missing data. Uh, you would be surprised. There's something different about image data. I, I'm just saying, I mean, I've been doing this for 15 years. There's something different about image data where people feel a right to it and they really want it and they get very upset when they can't have it as raw data. So, I think longitudinal disease data, again, is similar. It's nice to see how disease have progressed over time and map it onto, for example, you know, genetic makeup and such like, but it's not always available. Mm, yeah, I mean, the more we, yeah, the more that can be saved, the better. Um, the better. But 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 the the fact for the imaging is we're just we're just kind of reaching a level where where it's just too expensive. Um, okay. Um, what uh, what do people feel are key punchlines? Um, so Albert hasn't spoken. I know he said he had um, homeschooling duties. Um, if you're there, Albert, let us know if, if there are any key points that you took home. Um, if not, Ken, um, how would you summarize this discussion? You've been there the whole time, I think, over the last hour and 15 minutes. Or, if, uh, or over the last oh, I hour. think in terms of a summary of, of, of the discussion, yeah. I think we sort of concur on a discussion on um, the data types that can arise from um, single cell data, single cell experiment, experimental techniques. And I think we're pretty comprehensive in terms of touching on both genomics, imaging, and physiological um, uh, uh, um, measurements. And then we also went into taxonomies. How do we have sort of control for uh, vocabulary, vocabulary and uh, on different levels of data types? as well as touching upon a little bit on the cell type annotation, although I know that there will be a discussion later on, but mostly focus around um, discussion on different organization and what, what work has been done so far. And then we moved into a large discussion on the funding of how do we fund store, store, storage of imaging data? Yeah, I, th I think that we don't need to well, we can highlight it as a challenge. Right, it's a so big I think, challenge. Yeah, so, so I think, like, well, you can view it as either a funding challenge or you can view it as a compression challenge. Right. Um, I think yeah. um, where we're going forward with this is we are sort of in a data collecting mode as in, you know, what type of data, data, data types are there and what, what kind of uh, approaches people are taking and labeling those data types and then if we get that work done then we can work on sort of integrating this data. I, I, don't, I don't know if that's sort of yep. what the state of the affair is. Yeah I think maybe, that's... Maybe to me it was I mean I, I agree with that and maybe it was more like the the conclusion that there's an iterative maybe process between both the 
sort of effort to come to a taxonomy or an annotation and the tools that might provide the right resolution of that. So it's like hard to say we do uninformed by any taxonomy, we do all these molecular annotation or molecular measurements and then come up with something. The other way around is probably also not working, which I initially thought, you know, you come up with a taxonomy and you just annotate the cell types with additional modifier. It seems like it needs to really be like a iterative process in which you know, going back and forth between both additional data gathering or maybe refinement with additional uh, features and refinement of the taxonomy of the structure. Yeah. I really like that framing, Seb, and wonder, so one of the things that I took away from the earlier discussion was uh, potentially the very important role that assays that either cross scales or modalities, so we were talking about, you know, PAPSEQ or, you know, tomography into like, you know, do those methods play a disproportionately valuable role in those definitions of taxonomies and ontologies in your view? I think that's great. I mean, I think there, there could be potentially you can say soci sociologically uh, problematic assignments, right? That could be resolved with these kind of essays when you, yeah. um, that you can actually, you say, well, this is a hypothesis. We can resolve this with a specific essay, right? It's maybe not something where we want to have a whole atlas based on this modality, sure. but it can be used very specifically to resolve certain questions. Yeah. Um, Smaller amounts of patch seek data have exactly, you know, exactly. high value for, for these. Completely distinguishes. Or, the, or like the, the um, you know, the light treat that Alain was talking about. Right. Basically, and it, it, can, it can span modalities, but it doesn't cover all genes. But mm -hmm. then you could stitch other things onto that. You could yeah. stitch other data into that. I mean, would, so, so basically we have another 10 minutes now. Um, is there somebody who would like to go on the soapbox? So I think we have, we, we have the key points here is, um, is the point about, like a general point about annotation taxonomy ontology. Another point about data types for each taxonomy level, they can be specific to a taxonomy level. Some of them can, some of the data, data types can actually span cell to, to organ and upwards and so on, and can then act as a framework for other data types that are more limited in their, in their focus, but maybe broader in, in molecular profiling, the, the molecules that they map. Um, and um, in terms of cross consortium collaboration, I think the um, the cell annotation is an is a really obvious one, and i've I've seen notes from another session just now, emails coming in from Edlines and so on that they've they've also discussed that in other sessions. You know, so there's clearly scope for that. And like Jonah said, that can take place within a, you know, there can be different levels at, at which that can happen. So there can be within an organ network, um, or it can happen at a more formal kind of ontology level of, de you know, um, developing ontology databases and, and um, governance around unified ontologies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other major challenge, so there's a challenge around cell ontology, cell annotation, cell taxonomy, whatever you want to call it. That's, that's, a, that's a challenge. There's another challenge around um, compression for imaging data across, across single cells to organs um, that's going to force decision making on what to compress. Um, and I think that that really summarizes it. Who would like to who would like to um, present our group in the plenary? Two minute soapbox. So your 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 job would be just to make two slides, maybe with three bullet points each on you know those the key the key kind of things that we discussed at, at you know single cell and. Um, up to organ level, and then the challenges that we identified. I'm thinking Sebastian, Amy, 
can allow. Yeah, I think I might have to. Um, you. I have to maybe leave at some point later today, so okay. I'm not into it. No, so that's not good. Anybody else? I can do it if nobody else is doing it, although technically I'm an observer of this particular session, so I was trying <laughs> trying to not do it. Um, Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> All right. I think you'll crush it, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like supposed to just be quietly listening in, see how well I do with that. Fail. No, no, no. no uh, All right. I'll, I'll pull together a couple slides. Thank you so much, everybody, and, and mega massive thank you uh, to Amy from everyone. And thank you to all of you for being super participants. It was, it was really exciting.